Um, so I will try to give you all about five or seven minutes after, um, uh, before class is over to do that, because that's one of the ways I'm taking attendance. Um, I'm in my class, I take attendance two, three, four times a session, so I want to make sure you hear all the time. Um, you work. Did any level one students do that? Y'all get a pass. My level threes, y'all gonna get a pass. So, and, and it should already be done. So, if you all will, um, pass it down. Pass your reflective writing down to the uh, what is that, your right. And for my level one. There is no sign in sheet right now for level three, just your reflective writing. It's on, I'll turn it on. Please make sure your names are on it. Your names are on it, you get credit for it. Alright, now if you haven't turned it in, your reflective writing, I do suggest you uh, take some time to do that when you get a chance because um, and I think you need your, don't y'all have to be here a certain number of hours? Yeah, I think attendance is pretty important, right? Yeah. Alright, so we turn this in.
um, with a little bit of emphasis so that you can remember because we give you lots of information and it's my job not to open you up and fill you up with information. You have to do some work yourself. But it's my job to help point out what's important. This is important. Um, so the first thing that we do is assess. Before you, know before you go, okay? Assess the situation all the time first. Don't just jump in there like I'm about to save, super save the world. Assess the situation first. Because you don't know what to do. You don't know what you need to do first. You don't know um, where you're starting at. So you can figure out if where you ended up is better or worse. You must always start with assessment. Next is diagnosis. After you've assessed the situation thoroughly, then you can make a determination, a diagnosis about exactly what is going on. And based on what is going on, you need to prioritize people planning. What needs to be addressed first? Patient came in, his leg is missing, he's bleeding out, and he's coughing. And um, I don't know, let me see, what's something else? And, and, he's, and, he's, and he's got an infection. Well, the infection is important, Mm -hmm. um, but he's missing his leg and he's bleeding out. Probably a little bit more important. We want to address that first. There's a method to the madness in terms of determining what we do first. That's a good thing. Patterns are a good thing because they're predictable. So this isn't really, like we don't send you out there to play like this guessing game. Like there's a, there is a pattern as to how we decide. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and then once we plan and figure out what we're going to do first, we go do it safely. Um, and then we evaluate if what we did worked and if they're better or worse. Um, what's the ac acronym for that? Uh, AdPod. 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 Did y'all get that? Yes. There's an acronym, which means it's important, which means you need to remember it. What is it? AdPod. AdPod. Can I erase this stuff? Where's the, uh, where's the eraser? Anyone have a paper towel? <coughs> Oh, you're so great. Thank you. You're a tank full. Can I erase this? Yes. Because I don't need it. Now, you're going to see why this is one of the most important um, uh, theories in a minute. Um, I'll give you a hint. Uh, of course, everything that we do is based off of this, but then that means that everything that we test is based off of this. Um, so anytime I'm in getting ready to write a test question, oh, so by the way, I worked, um, I did some consulting work for Pearson um, Test Writing Group, who does the, um, writes test <coughs> questions for um, the NCLEX, as well as um, some of these other programs. So we take a concept, we figure out what level the question needs to be at, at what level the question should be, you know, in the sentence with the preposition. Um, and then we determine what we want to know about it. Do you know how to assess it? Do you know which nursing diagnoses are applicable? Um, so if someone is hemorrhaging out, I really don't, um, airway clearance <coughs> is not an applicable nursing diagnosis. And there's nothing wrong with their airway, they're hemorrhaging. We need, we need something that has to do with blood or fluids. Um, can you do it safely? Can you plan, can you, can you prioritize? That's the one, can you do it safely? And then do you know if, it, if, if, if what, you, what you're looking for to see if they have gotten better? So there's a method to how we write test questions. It's important to know that so then you can kind of decipher um, what we're doing when we write these questions. And if you can predict or figure out what it is we want to know that you know, then you should be able to just give it to us. So one, when, I teach, when I teach some of these review courses, um, one of the first things that I have to do is break down people's emotions. Because people want the right answer to be right so bad just because they want it to be. Um, I want you to save that passion for when you get out and practice. But for the NCLEX, just give them what they want. You know, um, now is not the time for you to tell them why that answer should be the way it is. Um, now it's time for you to pass and get a license and get a job. Um, but, the, you know, don't argue with the NCLEX. It's just, it's, it's so counterproductive. Just give them what they want. Just figure it out and give them what they want. And the good thing is that they're pretty consistent. Okay, so this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Anyone familiar with this? Yeah. Yeah. 
You all familiar with this? Uh, no? All right. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, in my quest for perfection, it's really not for perfection because there's nothing, perfection is relative, right? Because what you say, oh, I had the perfect date last night. Well, I had a horrible time. You know, per per perfect is relative. Good is relative. Um, I am on a quest for self-actualization where all of my needs are met. Um, and I'm feeling good about myself. Um, there, so before I can feel good about myself, like I have to build on this pyramid. Um, this bottom level, it may be at the bottom, um, but it is what is holding up this entire structure. So if my physiological needs are not met, um, if, if I'm having an issue with my A, Bs, or Cs, who cares? you know, about my, my sense of morality or my self-esteem or my friends. Like, I'm about to die. Um, so if I'm not alive, I can't really, like, actualize any of the rest of this stuff. Um, the next thing I need is to be safe. So I'm not bleeding out and I'm breathing okay, but um, I'm not in a safe situation, a safe environment um, for whatever reason. And so at any point, I could be bleeding out and not breathing because I'm not in a safe environment. So not only do I need to be alive, but I need to be safe. Um, and then I want to feel a sense of love and belonging um, and, and feel good emotionally. Um, and, and, and then I'll feel good about myself, even when I don't have a friend attached to the hip at any given moment. My friendships have definitely changed over the last three years. They're supposed to. We just talked about that. Good thing that they'll be there, but um, I'm still feeling good about myself where I am in the process. And I can problem solve any issues that come up and try to um, perturb or disturb any of this. Um, I can problem solve, fix something so that those needs are met and, and feel good about it um, and, and develop a sense of morality. Um, mor morality is also um, relative, what's right and wrong. You know, I teach an eternal child, so abortion is one of the things that comes up. Is it right or wrong? A sense of morality, it's all relative and culturally based. Um, so what does this mean for test taking? Um, something very important. This is how we prioritize what we attend to first, and we start at the bottom. So ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation is what we address first. Who should the nurse see first? The nurse um, comes on to shift and is giving a report on four patients. One of them has an infection, one of them can't breathe good, one of them feels lonely, and one of them is in pain. Who do we see first? Breathing. 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 The one that can't breathe good. That's who we see first. Who do we see next? Pain. pain. No infection. Infection. Um, we're, oh, no, this is a teaching moment. This is a good teaching moment. Pain is psychosocial. I don't care about your pain. I'm just kidding. We do. We're not in nursing school. It's just comes to territory. But um, pain is psychosocial. Let me say that again. Pain is psychosocial. Pain is psychosocial. Um, we're going to go with the infection next, then we're going to go with pain, and then we're going to go with um, I feel lonely. So here's the thing about pain. Pain is always psychosocial unless it starts to affect the body physiologically. So anytime you have somebody who is in pain, normal, regular pain, that is always considered psychosocial. So anything physical comes before that. If you have somebody who is in pain and they are also having something like increased respirations, so they're breathing faster, heart rate goes up, tachycardia, that's about it. Um, when the pain is so bad that it starts to affect them physiologically, that's when it becomes a physical problem. But, but you knew that because if there is a problem with their heart rate, then it's already a, a, an ABC anyway. Um, so pain is psychosocial. Uh, don't get tricked up. They like that. They like that one. Um, okay, so ABCs, then psychosocial. Um, why don't you all take a moment and um, order these in order of priority?
sorry. These are nursing diagnoses, by the way. So are you, have you all um, been introduced to nursing diagnoses yet? Okay. They are different than medical diagnoses. Medical diagnoses are diabetes, hypertension, um, um, melanoma, cancer, or um, um, Hodgkin's disease. A nursing diagnosis is ineffective airway clearance or activity intolerance. So um, you all should look up nursing diagnoses. I'm sure they're in the back of one of your books and so you can get an idea of what they um, look like. There is a NANDA approved list. NANDA, N-A-N-D-A, made a list. It said these are the only approved nursing diagnoses. <laughs> Yeah, so go ahead and take two or three minutes and number them. Uh, yeah, do this on your PowerPoint so you have it. So, so anytime you're you're studying, you're thinking, trying to figure out how to do better the next test, looking at test questions. Oh no, I don't know. Oh, you may want to do anything to do with the Still closed. Then the alternation. So you have a detection first. You have a detection first. Activity and tolerance. Activity and tolerance. Or activity and tolerance. Or activity and tolerance. Or activity and tolerance. prioritize these the same way every time. So what that means is if it says, if you recognize that there is alteration in nutrition in the stem of the question, and it says relate to some, some disease process you've never heard of a day in your life, it doesn't even matter what that disease process is because you know that altered nutrition is what you need to be focused on. And altered nutrition essentially looks the same. If it's altered, it's, it's altered regardless of what's causing it. Now you do need to know how nutrition works, but it doesn't matter what any of those things are related to, because you prioritize in the same way all the time, which is a good thing. In case you see words you don't know. Okay, you guys ready? Hold on, I got Prioritizing. That's part of critical thinking. However, 
um, not all of your questions will ask you to prioritize. And in a moment, I'll tell you how to know if the question is asking you to or not. Um, but let's prioritize these. So what's the first one that we should probably look at? It's not a trick question, but I, I did good. Um, <laughs> tell me about activity intolerance. Tell me, wait, let me, what's your name? Aisha, I thought that was number one because it was, I don't know for sure, but if a person's not moving, then that should be your priority because activity intolerance to me, I would think that means somebody's not moving. Why? Because, uh, like, you think of activity, that means moving around. And intolerance, to me, that means, like, you just can't tolerate it. Like, you can't do it. So, and what would happen if you did move, do, a, do that, move around and have a lot of activity? Uh, something you wouldn't be able to take it. Like, you wouldn't be able to stand it. Just can't do it. Right, you wouldn't be able to breathe because you'd be out of breath. That's what activity intolerance refers to. So that's somebody who... Yeah. Getting up yeah. and going to the bathroom, you're absolutely right. Getting up and going to the bathroom, and they're out of breath, because they don't have enough oxygen to support them. That's a tricky one, but activity intolerance, think about what's going on here. If I can't walk to the end of this room without becoming winded, and I can't breathe good, that's a breathing. That's a, that is, it's not even really breathing, it's, um, it's air exchange. It's gas exchange. You're not getting enough of the oxygen that you need. That's what activity intolerance really refers to. So that's a, that's a, um, it's a breathing, it's not airway, but it's a breathing. So that's why that's number one. Okay. Um, it, I'm sure it would have been easier if I had put something up there like um, an effective airway clearance and stuff. But you know, we we the, we're not gonna give you the most obvious answer, and they're not gonna do that on the inquest. So what you should have in your mind is that. The right answer is not going to be there, but the second best or the third best, or because we're not going to just, this isn't, um, you're not, we're not gonna baby you. Um, so, so you shouldn't expect to see the absolute right answer. The one that you know is right, it's not gonna be on there. You're gonna have to dig a little bit deeper, always. Okay, what's next? <laughs> Alter tissue perfusion. Yes. Not enough oxygen going to the to the, the, the tissue. Could be an oxygenation problem. Could be a circulation problem. But either way, it's an A, B, or C. It's one of those top ones. But before you can have altered tissue perfusion, you have, you have to have activity intolerance. Which is why that comes first. Come on, educate us. Come on, do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what's next? Infection. So you know what? We may have to take a step back. That fluid volume deficit may come before tissue perfusion because in order for your tissues to perfuse, you have to have enough fluid to begin with. Oh, so, I hope you're writing pencil. I'm sorry, I'm doing this along with you. I, just, I don't have the answers written down. We're figuring this out together. So, activity intolerance is number one. The fluid body deficit is number two. Tissue perfusion is number three. Do you all understand the sequence of that? The air has to come in, and then it has to be carried by the fluid, and then it can perfuse the tissues. All right, what's next? Also, you nutrition. So I'm thinking about this in terms of what can cause the biggest problem the quickest. What's going to kill my patient the quickest? Because that's what I need to prioritize, right? Infection. How long does it take somebody to die from infection? Every long time. Injury. It depends on the risk. They're immunocompromised, and and they are at risk for an infection. That kind of becomes like a safety issue, which is why we isolate those patients. If they ain't eating, they gonna, you know, starve. So, then they die. Uh, you know how long it takes to starve and die? Okay, well, what's gonna kill my patient? Safety issues. Safety, safety, safety. We're gonna kill them. Risk for injury. Yeah. 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 Safety. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. Risk for injury. Yeah. Yeah. Risk for injury. Yeah. 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 It could have been any type of injury. Yeah. This is probably one of the most important things that I can teach you today. That's why it's an activity. Um, 
So let me see, what do we have? We've got A, B, C, right. airway, <coughs> breathing, <coughs> circulation. Safety. S for safety. I for infection. Um, yes, sir. I was just wondering about this uh, impaired skin integrity. You might tell me something about shock. I was wondering why that didn't work. Um, okay, people go into shock for uh, two reasons. Okay, so what you're talking about is um, a progression. The point at which altered skin integrity causes somebody to become dehydrated, then it becomes a fluid volume issue. So now it's a C for circulation. By the way, fluid and blood are pretty much the same thing in terms of circulation. But let's go back for a second. Altered skin integrity. So what's the worst thing that, and you should always ask yourself these questions. What's the worst thing that can happen if somebody has altered skin integrity? Pressure, Pressure ulcer. Pressure ulcer, which can then become infected. So now, we're, so now we jump to infection. So now it's not really altered skin integrity anymore. It's infection that we're talking about. And that definitely comes before altered skin integrity. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen if somebody, if the infection progresses? Sepsis. 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 And, and then shock. shock. And now we have a circulatory yeah. issue. And so that's how we have kind of moved up the chain. So based on that, we know that infection needs to go before impaired in skin integrity. Um, so one of the things that may help us is, which ones are physical? Because we know those go first, right? Mm -hmm. So we should be focusing on this one. This is physical. They could like, you know, injure themselves in that. Um, psychosocial, <coughs> knowledge deficit is psychosocial. Uh, impaired skin integrity, that's physical. Physical, physical. Fatigue. Fatigue. <coughs> that's kind of a little psychosocial, unless it starts to affect them physically. So um, what happens when you're fatigued? The balance isn't all that good, so then it could become a safety issue, but it, but it, but only insofar as your balance isn't good. So they can't just say you're fatigued. They have to have the additional piece that says your balance isn't good for it to be a safety issue. So fatigue is psychosocial. Constipation, that's physical. Anxiety is psychosocial. And we've already got these. That's physical. So based on the physical ones, we've got nutrition and constipation, infection, <coughs> Urinary retention. Which one do you think should go first? Urinary retention or infection? Infection. Urinary retention is being infection. I'm a little, I think so I'm a little torn on that one. I think I'm gonna go with infection first. Now this is a judgment call. I feel pretty confident in my judgment at this point. But I'm gonna go with infection only because um, Urinary retention means that they are retaining fluid in their bladder. It does not mean necessarily that they are dehydrated or overhydrated. What's the worst thing that can happen if they continue to retain the fluid? Infection. Infection. Yes, ma'am. But doesn't that predispose them to infection because they have yeah. become catheterized in certain instances? That is a good point, but t tell me more. What's your name? Antoinette. Antoinette, tell me more. Like, yeah, straight or intermittent. Try to stay away from them, but if somebody's constantly re like retaining urine, that causes pain, which would then causes causes for us to break cast them, and if we break the sterility, that will cause an infection. So would that go first and then infection? But because we're trying to prevent the infection first, right? So it's, you have it a little bit backwards, because infection is the worst thing that we're trying to prevent. That's the thing that we want to prioritize. So if they already have an infection, straight cathing them isn't going to necessarily make their situation worse because they already have an infection. So if I have a patient who already has an infection and I have a patient who's at risk for infection, that's a really great point that you brought up the internet as a matter of fact. Um, what's the difference between an actual problem and a risk? Because all of these I have put, so some of these are risks and some of these are actual. And I don't really mean in this activity for you to differentiate between those two, but when you prioritize, actual problems go first. So if you have someone who is actually um, has an infection versus someone who has a risk for injury, that is that one. we need to um, address the actual infection first and then we address the risks. 
Because you can have a boatload of risks and none of them are actually happening yet. So you got a person who's risky as hell, but you got this one who's falling out right now. Right. And we go do the actual problems first. So infection is actual, and then the retention is in a risk for infection. It's the risk for infection. So technically, all of the actual problems go before that one risk. Um, yeah. But 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 safety. Safety is, 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 is really, uh, you know, I just, I, I, I really don't want you all to not prioritize safety no matter what, because um, risk for injury is an actual safety issue, so it really is kind of an actual problem. It's not like risk for dehydration, where they're not dehydrated yet, we're just kind of like watching and waiting. This risk for injury is a real, actual, someone, fell down, they have a spinal cord injury, and if we move them, it can cause permanent paralysis. That's a risk for injury, that's a dangerous situation. But um, I have a couple of key safety situations that I'm gonna tell you about so that you know what those safety situations are and you're not guessing. Um, okay, yes ma'am. Um, can urinary retention lead to rupture of the, blood, of the bladder? Yes, that's, that's the first worst thing that will happen. Because just because you're retaining fluid doesn't mean that you are at risk for, um, well, so if the urine stays in there for a long time, it can grow bacteria. If we introduce anything to get the urine out, it can, cause, it can introduce bacteria. But the fastest thing will happen is that if you're retaining fluid before you even have a chance to develop an infection, because incubation periods are what, 24 to 48 hours at least, your bladder's gonna rupture. Um, a rupture is bad because then you've got internal bleeding. So um, then it becomes a circulatory issue. Um, if you've got urine floating out in the, um, the peritoneal cavity, then um, it also becomes an infection issue, but circulation trumps infection. Um, so there are some issues with urinary retention. And in fact, it can become a circulatory problem very quickly. So you need to think about that. But to say you have a full bladder, um, you know, in, in a couple of hours, if I don't get a chance to go to the bathroom, I will have urinary retention myself. But, but that is not as significant as if I had an infection and, and needed an antibiotic at that moment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it doesn't, see me after class. Um, not because I want to be right, but because I want you to be successful. And that's, it, that's the way it is. Um, okay, what's next? So, um, urine, the urinary system goes before gastrointestinal. For this reason, if you are having a blockage, constipation, and you're, or, or you're not moving, um, so, if you have constipation, that means there's a blockage, right? Yeah. Everybody with me? Yes. What's the worst thing that can happen? It can rupture, right? Yeah. right. Same boat as we are with the urinary retention, right? The problem is that urinary retention becomes a fluid issue because we're talking about fluid that gets reabsorbed in the body's circulation. If you rupture a gut, bust a gut, we're, you know, it's not going to affect your fluid status. Now, it puts you at risk for hemorrhaging and for, um, um, for um, peritonitis, um, an infection, sepsis, but um, the urinary system is more closely linked to the circulatory system. Now, if you have diarrhea, that's a little, I, diarrhea is more significant than constipation because too much diarrhea and you can become dehydrated so now we have a circulatory issue. Jesus, <laughs> Ooh. So constipation is not as severe as diarrhea. So urinary concept right now because it's This is good stuff. Because if you can, if you can get this, you will be successful, not only on your exams, in this program, but also on the NCLEX. All right, let's keep going. So what's um, the urinary retention? I don't think there's any risk for injury. We said what's the risk? I think we're going to go ahead and say infection, infection. here. Right. And we're going to say um, GI, genital, uh, GI, I made that up. G that, yeah, that's GU, there we go. So G G U as in genital urinary, G I as in gastrointestinal. What's any oh nutrition? Um, because b b 
you'll die of a of a of a busted gut or or um, circulatory issues um, if it becomes that or infection or any of those before you die from starvation. So that's why nutrition goes down here. Nutrition is important, but it, it'll it, it, it's not going to kill you as quickly as some of those others. Um, what else do we have? So this impairing skin, I mean skin integrity is next. Oh, you're right. I think we should do skin integrity here. After infection? Oh, no. Before nutrition? Before nutrition? Yeah, before nutrition. Because what's the worst thing that can happen if you are not, if you are malnourished? You have skin breakdown. Infection. And your body doesn't, re doesn't heal, um, which is why people, uh, you can get an infection um, because of the skin breakdown. Then activity in Oh, I mean, uh, yes, you can get an infection because of nutrition, because you, your, your immune system. Your protein levels are low. Um, did we miss any of the physical ones? Can you give the order? Can you just, can you say the order? Um, we have to get to the end of it, because I'm doing this with you all. I mean, I don't have the answers written down. Where are we all? I think we're almost done. And then I can go back and tell you the order. Okay. So we got it. What's pain. next? Come on, let's go. Pain. It's fatigue pain or pain? Pain, pain fatigue, and um, anxiety. We have pain, fatigue, and anxiety left. I'm going with pain. Say it again. I'm going with pain. I'm going with pain. Okay, come on, stay with me here. We have four left. We have pain, we have knowledge deficit, we have anxiety, and fatigue. Um, I think pain. Anxiety. Pain is that borderline between physical and psychosocial. So it should always be the first psychosocial that you address. So pain, but and then anxiety. fatigue, and then anxiety, and then knowledge deficit. So. That should tell you right there that teaching is one of the lower priorities on the intervention list. Right. So if it's like teach the patient about whatever, you better make sure there's no other physical or psychosocial um, interventions that need to be done for an actual problem. Yes, ma'am. Can you go, why, go over why anxiety goes uh, under pain? Because um, the worst thing that can happen with somebody who has anxiety is that they put themselves at risk for a safety issue. So if they have anxiety, they may um, 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 think about somebody who's anxious. Like, what's the worst thing that they can do? Like, have a meltdown? Um, yeah, they can't sleep because they're not going to sleep, then they're going to be, um, they're gonna be What happy. is going to stress them? Now, when you say stress, do you mean physical stress or do you mean psychological stress? Both. Both? Okay, great. Now, if you mean physical stress, I heard somebody say I don't understand. I would suggest do more listening. Um, psych um, so you said psychological and physical stress, but what is going to stress the body quicker, pain or anxiety? Pain. Now those pain and anxiety are often linked, so we try to help people be less anxious because then they will feel less pain, but pain is going to make your blood pressure and your heart rate and your breathing go up. Um, Probably before anxiety will, depending on how bad the pain is. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, you can hyperventilate. And so if the question says, a, per a person with a history of anxiety is breathing at 40 breaths per minute, you know that... If a person, um, if the question says a person with a history of anxiety is breathing at 40 breaths a minute, you, you see anxiety and you're like, okay, this is the medical diagnosis, or it even could be a nursing diagnosis, but you also have breathing at 40 breaths per minute, which is the definition of um, tachypnea, which we would expect is probably hyperventilation for somebody who has anxiety. I think that's a reasonable expectation. So your focus is not so much on the anxiety, but on the fact that they're breathing so fast. And you know that because even no matter what is going on, if they have 15 different things going on, you got anxiety and you got breathing, and you know always we prioritize breathing. So your interventions need to be about their breathing and not about 
their anxiety. So a way that you could get tricked, a way that we may try to discriminate if you really know um, what you're doing is that we will give you an answer choice that says, um, review the patient's anxiety medications or give them a, a, um, a paper bag to breathe in. And if you are thinking anxiety, you may be thinking whatever intervention is going to address their anxiety, but that's not the problem. The problem is that they're breathing too fast and that they need to re-breathe in that oxy or that um, CO2 that they're breathing off. So the answer choice would be give them the paper bag. Right, so that requires you know about oxygenation. It requires you know about respiratory acidosis and hyperventilation. It requires that you know um, maybe a little bit about anxiety, maybe not. But if you can identify the problem that the question is asking about, then you won't get distracted. Because what we do really good at is distracting. Because we need to discriminate. If you could, because when it comes down to it and the person is in front of you, are you going to be distracted by all the 15 other things, the family member, who has anxiety, who's acting a fool, you know, all these other things that's going on, or can you focus in on what's the priority? Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, I was just speaking from like like the person who actually has anxiety attack. Like the actual act of having an anxiety attack is very mental. So like, I see why pain will go first because it, like if you're in pain, it's like it's mental, but it's also a physical. It can become a physical act where the anxiety itself, like not the fact that you might hyperventilate, but the fact that you're having this anxiety attack is something like you feel like you're dying, but it's inside yourself. Like it's not natural. It's not really happening. So if you have anxiety, once you if you can tell a person with anxiety this is not really happening to you, it kind of helps them more than anything else. So I see why the pain will go first. So an appropriate intervention would be maybe to talk to them to help calm them down. Um, but the first thing, the first thing that we want to do would be to address their breathing. Um, yes, ma'am. I always thought that whenever someone had pain, that was priority. Like I understand you saying the infection should be first, but I don't see why. Like how would you know someone had an infection or not? Like you come in the room they have an infection, opposed to you coming up and start saying, my head is hurting and I feel like it's an eight out of 10. Wouldn't you give that patient their pain medication group? Um, that's a great question. Um, you asked, um, well, first of all, you said, I thought, I always thought that pain was a priority. Um, this is why we're having this class, so I can tell you pain is not a priority. It is psychosocial every single time on every single question, especially on the in class, unless it is accompanied by a physiological change, like increased heart rate or increased respirations or increased blood pressure. Um, the other thing you said was, um, <clears throat> ask the question again, because that's the really important piece about you, why, why infection over pain. How would you come in and assess it and say someone has an um, infection? That's a, that, that's a better question. That's a better question. How would you know what your patient has? Elevator white blood. Assess. Assess. Culture. Because the very the question is how do you know what your patient has? How do you know that they have say him? I, yeah, I understand that, but I'm saying, like, say say I have arthritis and my knee is swollen and it's red. Red, that's not an infection too, but I'm saying my knee hurts right now. So you will give them a pain medication, probably if they had that on the order before, you will, you will give them an anti-inflammatory response medication. Do you know what I'm saying? Um. <laughs> like, I would always think you would assess what's going on right now first, that you know. It's going on. Okay, so let me this is this is important. Yes, we need to be very conscious of our time. So when I go in to see a mom who just had a baby, I know she's probably in pain because she hasn't had I'm this my first I'm just going in to see her. I just got on the shift. So I have anticipated and put some pain medication in my pocket. And while I'm assessing her to figure out what's going on with her, because that's how I know what's going on with her, I assess her. That's the most important piece right there. Um, she says I'm in pain, and I also see that she has a temperature. So I'm thinking, I wonder if she has an infection. Um, my priority is to address her infection. But because I anticipated, and she tells me I'm in pain, I'm like, here, pop this pain medication while I go figure out what to do about your infection. And to make sure, because 
that is, um, it's, it is subjective, more subjective assessment information to get a temperature. I mean, it's objective because you would, you know, 100.6, and that's, that's objective. We know that she has a temperature. But there is more objective data that I need to confirm that. So um, that is one of the things that you definitely want to be thinking about. What is the assessment data that goes for, for example, all of those or any of those um, uh, nursing diagnoses? Because if you can't identify when there is an infection, um, and so for example, what assessment goes with infection? Temperature, um, um, color, color, smell, smell. Drainage. Those are all great. What is the best piece of information? Is that, wait a minute. What's your name? Sapien. Say it again. Sapien. Sapien? Yep. Sapien. What is the best indicator of infection? <coughs> Sapien. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> something like a lab body, like elevated white blood cells, but I'm saying coming in as an assessment, you don't know that. I'm saying basically- Why don't you? I mean- You better know when you come on my floor. <laughs> no, I'm saying- <laughs> No, no, I'm serious though. You're saying all you see is a rash. That just might be because the sheet was rubbing on it hard or something. It might not be an infection. Let me have all of you all's attention, especially those of you in level three. You all better not do any intervention unless you have the supporting evidence, as in you have assessed, and then you have gone and, and tried to confirm. So before you talk about addressing anything other than that pain medication you gave because you anticipated, um, you need to uh, be checking lab values, and you need to be saying, if there are no lab values drawn, I need to call the doctor because my patient, I think, may have an infection, I just took her temperature, and we need a white blood cell count and a CRP, and maybe even a culture drawn. And if it's not my responsibility, whose is it? Um, so so it, it, if you don't know, my question to you is why don't you know? Because that is, um, let me go back to the slide, because that is the absolute starting point so, of everything. Yes, sir. So we will treat the pain, but you're saying that the infection is the most the most important thing that we will prioritize would be finding out the, the infection. However, because our patient is complaining of pain, it is our right to administer the pain medication. Right, right, right. Now, okay. if you if you have to make if if the pain medica if it will take you I don't know if you got to go dig up the pain medication and mix it up in the lab and and you you know it's gonna take you three hours to get this pain medication and 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 she may have an infection. That pain medication is gonna have to wait. Right. But if it's in your pocket, go and give it to her. Don't you know? Don't walk right. out the room with pain medication in your pocket and she just told you she's in pain. Okay. So that's just the priority is the infection. If I only get to this, these next two slides, I will have given you the bulk of what you need to be successful. So stick with me because this is important. There are levels of questions. This is the third theory. One, two, <coughs> well, this is the fourth, last and final, I think. Bloom's taxonomy, this is important. When you first come in and we ask you to match body parts to, to their function, that is knowledge, that is rote memorization. You spit it back out at us, it's either right or wrong. Whether you understand how those functions work together, that's comprehending, do you understand? But then can you apply what you know? So based on these, the way the body functions, if there is an alteration or a change, do you, can you apply that knowledge that you have about what that alteration means for the rest of the functions? And can you address it? And then can you analyze that what you did was effective or not based on what you know and understand about what's going on? Evaluation. So these we kind of collapse these. The point is, we have to start testing you at this level. We can't just ask you to apply knowledge that you don't have yet. So expect to see questions that look like this, these knowledge questions. But the level of passing is here and above. So um, you can do great on all this 
rote memorization, and you can spit back the labs and all this stuff and say it's within normal limits, but if you don't know what to do with that, you're not going to pass the NCLEX because this is passing level. Um, and that's important to know because I don't want you to, so, um, you can get any kind of question on the NCLEX questions, but you start out at passing. It's in your best interest to stay at passing. You don't want to dip down here. I personally think these questions are harder because either you know it or you don't. It's either right or it's wrong. You throw a big word out there, I may not know. I don't know. I don't know that med. I don't know. It's a 50-50 chance. Maybe I can narrow it down to two. But if you give me a priority question, because up here at this analysis level, these are all priority questions. I can prioritize with the best of them. So I would rather have these questions because you prioritize the same way all the time, no matter what it's related to. And don't give me something down here that I don't know because it's a crapshoot. So for every question you get right, you go above the line. You get one wrong, you go back down. If you continue to get them wrong, you continue to go down. And then you have to build yourself back up. So one of the important things is to take your time and stay above the line. And that's the difference. So how does the test determine if you have passed or not? How much time you spent above the line or how much time you spent below the line? So um, for example, if you come in, you take your time. And how many questions on the exam? I think something like 215 is the max, but you could have as low as 75. 75, right. I'd suggest everybody shoot for 75, even if it takes you three hours. So take your time and stay above the line, because if you spend a good, per, whatever the percentage is, I don't, there's a, a, an, a logarithm for determining it, but if you spend that time above the line, they can say with confidence, she has the minimal competence to be a nurse. Pass her, 75 questions. If you're skirting the line and you're back and forth, they can't tell, you haven't spent enough time above the line or in any one place. So that's when you're 215 questions out. The thing about it is if you are still getting questions, you are still in the running. Because when if you spend too much time down here, they're gonna be like, she has confidently sure shown us that she does not need to do that. <laughs> so we gonna fail at 75. But most of you all have at least enough knowledge to skirt the line. And and so most people who fail the exam, they get to the last question, they they fail it at 215, not at 75. So <clears throat> Try to stay above the line and, and know and know which questions will keep you there.